rangs de troupes Viet Cong dans notre dos. Ultime tentative pour se rapprocher davantage de la voiture et avoir de plus amples informations sur le sort des passagers. Mais une quinzaine d'hommes courbés en deux, courant dans les taillis pour prendre position, nous ont obligés à effectuer une retraite précipitée. What you've been listening to and watching right there is the last known footage of Sean Flynn in Vietnam and Cambodia. And that's going to be the, um, the topic of our show tonight. Sergeant Major Dave McMillan, the MIA hunter, protege of Tim Page, who spent 15 years in Southeast Asia as a security consultant and an adventurer. And his partner, Scott Brantley, spent 10 years of that with him as a bodyguard and uh, as a also a second in command. And Scott Brantley is a friend of this show. And we are glad to have Dave McMillan in. Dave, welcome into the show. Good morning. Good morning, Australia, and good morning, America, and good morning, Vietnam, babies. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Campuchia, and thank you very much. It, I know it's evening time where you are, sir, but good evening, America. It's nice to be with you guys. Well, we certainly have um, had a couple of sessions where we kind of worked out that time dif difference. I think there's a 15-hour yes, time difference, and we are live, but uh, we, we've worked that out. We're going going strong here. I want to go ahead and start, just dive right into this as you're, um, you were searching for Sean Flynn for about 15 years, I guess is what it is, what, what you're saying, or possibly even more, but let's go ahead firstly and say who Sean Flynn and Dana Stone were and, and, and what, what it was about them that makes this an important story. Yes, sir. Well, Sean Flynn was the son of the Australian actor from Tasmania, Errol Flynn. Errol Flynn famously met a film starlet on the boat across from Europe to the United States, a film starlet by the name of Lily Demeter. And he got her pregnant and they had a kid together called Sean. They only had one child, Errol's only son, Sean, Sean Flynn. So Sean was the result of the coupling of an Australian father who was naturalized as an American and uh, a French mother. And he was born in the United States. He grew up down in Florida. Errol was a very famous movie star, but um, when Errol was born, uh, when Sean was born, Errol was kind of, his career was starting, he was famous, but then his career went into decline. And, uh, Errol died in 1959. Sean and uh, Errol's other children were at Errol's funeral at the uh, Rudyard, Kipling, Rudyard Kipling Chapel at um, the Glendale Cemetery there. That, and uh, Errol's buried not far from where Rudolph Valentino was buried. And um, so at Errol's funeral, Sean... Um, that that was like the last time that Rory Rory Flynn and uh, the sisters saw Sean. Sean, after that, he went into a B-grade kind of movie career. He made The Son of Captain Blood, which was uh, a sequel ripoff to Errol's most popular first film, Captain Blood, the movie that made him. And uh, Sean ended up going to Vietnam in 1965 and once he arrived in 1965, he arrived with the intention of becoming a photojournalist. I must also say that Errol was a journalist during the Spanish Civil War. So Sean was very much following in his father's footsteps from after the, his father's death. He kind of followed very closely in his father's footsteps. And uh, it ended up resulting in his disappearance in 1970. He went over into Cambodia from Vietnam on an assignment with his friend Dana Stone. Dana Stone was working for CBS and Sean was working for Time. Uh, and they both went missing at a place that was 14 kilometers from the Vietnam border in eastern Cambodia called Chi Pu. But more specifically, they were stopped at a roadblock at a place called Prepadao Nau, which is on Highway 1 not far from the town of Barvet, which is a very popular casino town now in Cambodia. 
Sean was a, a movie star, a photojournalist, and um, Sean was criticised by many people during the war by the fact that he used to go out with the Green Berets and it got to a point where he was more interested in being involved in the military operations than he actually was in taking photograph, photographs. And there was one situation in Kontien when the Special Forces were under attack and a whole bunch of uh, Hill Tribes mercenaries were being directed by U.S. Special Forces and the U.S. Special Forces team had been hit. And then uh, the, the Hill Tribes mercenaries didn't know what to do. So Sean picked up a rifle and a hand grenade and he charged the hill and he f and the, the Special Forces followed him over the hill and they took the hill, they killed a whole bunch of NBA. And the press at that time took photographs of Sean doing that and it was among all of the colleagues, people were saying from then on that some people believed that he had became an illegal combatant in the war because of the fact that he was a journalist that was involving himself in combat. So, yeah, uh, Sean was uh, – and uh, Sean – I represented Sean for his sister, Rory Flynn, and the family when I was looking for Sean in Cambodia, but I was introduced to the case – by Tim Page, and this was a legacy project for Tim Page from the very beginning because they were his colleagues, and then the year before, um, Tim had been hit seriously in the, in the brain and got brain damage and he had to get – he was returned to Bethesda Hospital in Maryland where he was recuperating when Sean and Dana went over to Cambodia to cover the overthrow of Prince Sihanouk coup d'etat which resulted in Mon Nol taking over Cambodia and the Khmer Rouge invade the eastern border. So Sean, Sean and Dana went out to cover what was happening on the eastern border with the NVA and Khmer Rouge invasion. And uh, in Vietnam and Cambodia, it was different because in Vietnam there was helicopters and armoured personnel carriers and all this different support. That, and all these troops that could take them out in the field. But in Cambodia, they were without that. So Sean and Dana had went to Phnom Penh and rented these two brand-new uh, 90cc Honda motorcycles, and they rode out to the border, and that was the last that was ever seen of them. So the last piece of footage that you see there, Sean had found out – at Sean and Dana had found out at a press release in Spading that out on the – out towards the border, there was a car that had been ambushed and that uh, the authorities believed that it was the vehicles of uh, these this group of journalists that had left the night before to try to drive from Cambodia over into the Vietnamese border and that they'd been ambushed and that the cars had been shot up. So Sean and Dana decided that they were going to go out there and cover the story and find out what had happened to their fellow colleagues. But unfortunately... They were also ambushed at the same roadblock and captured. And over a, from between the 5th of April 1970 and the 8th of April 1970, 13 foreign nationals went missing at that same roadblock in Cambodia. And Sean and Dana were two of those people. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and play that play that clip again. We played it at the, at the top of the show. I'm going to play it now since we've been talking about that to give it some context. Le reporter Sean Flynn, qui nous a rejoint à vélo moteur, nous signalait des mouvements de troupes Viet Cong dans notre dos. Ultime tentative pour se rapprocher davantage de la voiture et avoir de plus amples informations sur le sort des passagers. Mais une quinzaine d'hommes courbés en deux, courant dans les taillis pour prendre position, nous ont obligés à effectuer une retraite précipitée. So that brings us to the uh, subject of the MIA hunting, because it, it, there seems to be a culture around the MIA hunting. There, the, Tim Page, which has just recently passed away, which we need to talk about him. He was a colleague of Flynn's over there. And then I guess whenever he went missing, kept looking for him. Is that is that kind of safe to say? Yeah, that's true. But uh, from from my perspective, um, I got into this MIA hunting thing for personal reasons. My grandfather was in the 51st Highland Division. He was a Gordon Highlander soldier, and he was the first Commonwealth Special Forces casualty of the Second World War. My grandfather was on the uh, Maginot Line when the Germans overran, 
And uh, my father was born in 1938 and my grandfather went missing in 1940. So my, grandfa my, my grandmother and my father uh, were looking for my grandfather in all these invalid hospitals throughout Europe, war hospitals for eight years until the British government and the War Graves Commission was able to let my family know that my, the status of my grandfather was no longer missing in action and that my grandfather was actually killed in action and that we found his remains. So uh, my father, he had no brothers or sisters and he spent the first eight years of his life going through these hospitals looking at these horribly deformed people that had been uh, hit in the war, asking them if, uh, if they were his father. And um, so I, I was brought up understanding that about my father. So when I found out about the Sean Flynn thing and I found out uh, and I watched Danger on the Edge of Town and I found out about Sean, uh, Sean Flynn's disappearance and Tim Page's legacy project to be able to try to repatriate the remains of his best friend, I became very interested in that because of the personal connection that I had with um, having a, a grandfather that was MIA. So th that kind of gave you a, a, a automatic aptitude to to be in like uh, with Tim Page as a protege. How did that happen? I met Tim Page in Saigon through some friends, and he and I hit it off pretty much straight away. There are a lot of people that were taking advantage of Tim at that time because his popularity had um, waned for a while. He wasn't as popular ha as he had been. And uh, although a lot of people had read his books, um, he wasn't really making much money at that time. He was working to try to sell his photographs and doing a whole bunch of exhibitions throughout Southeast Asia. And all of these guys in Southeast Asia were being crooks to him and they were ripping him off. So when he and I met each other and I was a security consultant with the Vietnamese government and uh, a private in the Vietnamese security forces working as a operations manager for a company in Ho Chi Minh City, well, it, it kind of seemed for him like a perfect fit because he was entering into all these business deals and people were reneging on payment to him. And then he met this six foot five guy who had all these connections that could help him get the money back so there was all these situations where tim got me to help him um recover funds from uh photographic exhibitions where people hadn't paid him after the exhibition and said that they were going to pay him and and like situations where people had stolen photographs of his and photographs of sean flynn so i kind of became i became his debt collector and standover man to be able to get money back for him and that's how he and i kind of became friends because i had a compassion for him because of the whole mia thing because i could understand what it was like because i had that connection to my grandfather and my father and i we we always wanted to find my grandfather even though my, we found out that he was dead we're kind of we we had that we always had that connection my father was able to go over to my grandfather's grave thankfully but with sean uh Sean's family and Tim, they were never able to go and pay their respects to Sean because of the fact that Sean's remains were never recovered. And so, uh, you you did a lot of research, and you got and you and Tim were, I guess, allied at that time. But at some point, you had a difference of philosophy or some some thing that caused you to uh, uh, go a separate way from Tim. What? Kind of describe what happened in that situation. Okay, so Tim and I had become very close, and um, Tim wanted to go. Tim wanted to go into Cambodia. This is this is a crazy thing about the whole story. Tim wanted to go into Cambodia and dig the site where I ended up digging, and he wanted to use mechanical excavation. And I said to Tim at that time, "Man, you know, I think we should let the U.S. government." do it i think we should let them do it in an anthropological way i don't think we should use mechanical excavation and then tim and i had a big fight, argument about this and uh it was pretty crazy because he was like in a sarong with a joint in his mouth in ho chi minh city at, on this balcony fucking trying to take a swing at me and everything i was just dodging as much as saying oh 
respectfully, Tim, I just think we shouldn't use a mechanical excavator at this point. And then uh, I, I hadn't seen Tim for about 18 months, but I kept on working on my research. I kept on finding new documentation. So um, my brother and I, we decided we were going to go into Cambodia and, and have a look into this ourselves. And we contacted Rory Flynn and let her know that we had this information. And uh, so I contacted Tim to let to to speak to him and, and offer him to come in with me. And Tim, at that time, he just returned from Afghanistan. That day, he just returned from Afghanistan. And I spoke to him on the phone. I said, Tim, I need you to come in with us. We're going to go and have a look at that site. He said, you know, I'm not really interested in it. I don't think the information is correct. And I might look into it in a couple of years, but no, I'm not really interested. You know, don't waste your time. You're not going to find anything out there. I've had a look out there. There's nothing to be found. It's a complete waste of time. So I thought, well, I beg to differ. I want to check it out myself. And then I went into Cambodia and I was at that location with Scott. We were there for approximately six weeks. We were digging a whole bunch of holes. And then on the final day, on the 11th hour, we, we ourselves used a mechanical excavator. And uh, we used a mechanical excavator because we had found out from the locals that the individual that was killed out there was lapidated. And I don't know if you understand what I mean by lapidated, but lapidation is the when uh, the process of stoning somebody to death. So we had information from eyewitnesses to the murder and accomplices to the murder that they tied this guy's hands up behind his back and thrown him into a, into a hole. And then they'd taken a whole bunch of rocks and stoned him to death when he, when he was alive inside that hole. So because of the fact that we knew that he'd been lapidated, we understood that there was a whole bunch of rocks on top of the remains. So using a mechanical excavator would have damaged the remains. So we used a mechanical excavator and um, uh, we had a whole team there and we were surrounded by all these Cambodian locals that were there. And I thought that I wasn't going to find anything. Everybody else thought we weren't going to find anything. And then all of a sudden the excavator picked up this piece of clothing and then we said, stop, stop, stop. And we jumped down and we started to, we saw these rocks and we started to pull the rocks out. And uh, then there was this big rock in kind of the, in the wall of the excavation, pulled the rock out. And then, oh, well, Mike, one of the Cambodians that was there pulled the rock out. And as he pulled the rock out, I put my hand out and a jawbone and dibula fell into my hand with porcelain infused crowns in the jaw fell into my hand and then we started to find skull fragments and then we started to find long bones and we, all, the, all of these different bone fragments of this individual. So, uh, and uh, we, we found his clothing and it was an amazing experience. It was a traumatic experience, but it was like an uplifting experience because the Cambodian people at first, they saw... They saw what we were doing, and once they saw that we found the bones, they, they let out this, like, cry, this amazing cry. Everybody just started crying and, and laughing and celebrating that we found the bones because in Cambodia, if somebody goes missing and somebody's killed there, the local people have the spiritual belief that the individual that they found there, um, their, their spirit will forever haunt that area. So from the Cambodians perspective when we found those remains we lifted a curse from their village and uh it, it was a it was an amazing day and then uh we took the remains back to Phnom Penh we went to the odontological academy the dental academy of Phnom Penh we x-rayed the mandibula and then uh approximately five days later I went to the U United States embassy in Phnom Penh and I officially handed the remains over to the United States government on approximately, I think it was the March the 29th, um, 2010 is the day that I handed the remains over to the US government. And they're in custody yet. The, the remains are still in the custody of the US lab in Hickam, Hawaii. And this on the screen here, this is what you found in Cambodia right here. Yeah, so you can see it, it's, it's fairly considerable because that type of dental work, that type of bridge with the porcelain infused crowns in there was very unusual for the time. 
uh, there was a, and that's how, one of the ways that we're able to track, track it back to Japan because between 1960 and 1965, there are approximately 30,000 of these operations conducted in Japan on uh, wealthy Japanese individuals. And then after 65, this type of bridging wasn't really um, a common occurrence, even in the United States until like the mid 1990s. So the dental that we found was very rare. From the beginning, we worked out that it was a wealthy individual that we had found. And uh, we were looking for Sean Flynn at that time. So it triggered this international misinformation, disinformation um, campaign saying that we'd found Sean Flynn. They found Sean Flynn. Because this is it. Once I found the bones, Tim's attitude went from, oh, you're not going to find anything to like, how dare you have went and done this without me? It was like, mate, I called you up. I asked you to come and do it with me, but you refused. So now that we've found the remains, you don't like me anymore now. And then he started to say that I desecrated a war grave, that I'd used a mechanical excavator in an irresponsible way, all of these crazy things. And uh, then he hooked in with all of these international journalist friends of his, and then they came up with like this narrative of how they were going to try to discredit Scott Brantley and my work. And there's all of these horrible articles around the world um, and tabloid articles in the news of the world in Britain saying that I'm, that uh, Brantley and I were drinking from the skull like Lord Byron and all of these horrible things. It, when you have people saying that you desecrated a war grave and your grandfather was the first Gordon Highlander that, that was killed in the Second World War, that is probably the highest insult. So they just got very insulting. Then they did this article in Vietnam Veterans Magazine called Still uh, Still Desperately Seeking Sean, written by this journalist by the name of Richard Lynette. And in that article, Tim Page called Scott Brantley and I feral animals and said that uh, we, we desecrated a war grave, that, uh, we, that we shouldn't be given any oxygen, all of these horrible things. And, uh, and, and it really hurt us at the time because of the fact that we put so much of our moral integrity and ethics into this thing in the first place. And Brantley and I, we, we weren't responsible for any of the, the, the horrible things that they kind of made out that we were involved in. So from then on, Tim and, and his partner and some of his friends, they would just say horrible things about us. And, you know, this was published in Vietnam Veterans Magazine, which is a very popular magazine in the United States. So Brantley and I, we decided we weren't going to give up. We knew we hadn't found an American. We knew that we found a Japanese. So we just kept at it. And then um, when President Trump got in, I was contacted by the Defence Intelligence Agency, Stony Beach. They wanted me to work for them as a contractor. And at that time, they let me know, the person that you found in 2010 was a Japanese. That's as far as we've gotten on this. So when I was working for the Defence Intelligence Agency, I went and I met this guy called Kong Vaughan. Kong Vaughan was a Khmer guide, Cambodian guide, that had taken Ichinose Taizo and his colleague Ishiyama Koki over to where they went across to the Khmer Rouge side. And um, I was able to find out details about these two Japanese individuals. Then the Defence Intelligence Agency contacted the son of Ishiyama Koki, who actually is a journalist that covers foreign, foreign relations at the Pentagon. We secured a DNA sample from him, uh, a, a familiar, DNA, a film, familiar DNA, DNA sample, and then the United States government was able to confirm that it was not Ishiyama Koki. So as soon as we found out that it wasn't Ishiyama Koki, we found out about Ichinose Taizo, and then we looked at the photographs of Ichinose Taizo, the relative shape of the jaw perfectly matches the mandibula that we found. There was scarring on Taizo Ichinose's face because he was a, a, a baseball player in the in Japan and that he copped a baseball in the face and it, it has shattered his jaw. And uh, so it, 
we it just perfectly it's like uh cinderella you know we found it's instead of cinderella um putting the shoe on that fit perfectly we found photographs of uh ichinose taizo and then the overlays perfectly of the scarring on his face perfectly matched the actual um the scarring on the bones from the accident that he had and yeah so uh it, it was a very long process and one of the things that complicated the situation was the fact that in 1981 the year that i was born ichinose taizo's mother and father had went to cambodia to try to find the remains of ichinose taizo they went up to siem reap and they uh they paid off these khmer rouge murderers lying murderers who went and picked up the remains of just a random cambodian and sold it to the uh to taizo's mother and father so taizo's mother and father they got some closure from the situation by the fact that they 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 were given these bones and that they washed these bones but because there was no identifiers there was nothing to identify taizo there was no pre-indicators on the remains his family was unsure and they were worried about taking the remains back to japan and they thought that if they brought the remains back to japan that it would curse the plane or something like that so the remains that they that they bought from the cambodians were left and there's this place called uh prayer deck in siam reap and uh they there was a shrine created there and the american government at the time they wrote you know man, uh we know what these japanese people have done but they've they've been like they've been bullshitted by this Khmer Rouge from our information we know that that guy never got up there and uh they've just sold this they've just sold this family a random body that's what happened and so but because of the the fact that Taizo's parents went up there and it was so important to them and and the the locals had sold them this bullshit story that this um shrine was established up there and everybody thought that Taizo's remains had been recovered in 1981, but it was not the case. It, uh, we don't know whose remains are in that shrine and pray deck. It's probably just a Cambodian or maybe a French guy or something like that, but it's definitely not Ichinose Taizo. Uh, and uh, what happened to Taizo when we looked at the documentation, the reason why the US said it was bullshit from the beginning is because they understood that Taizo had been captured in Kampong Chum and then he went over in Kampong Chum and they had information, US government information from Khmer Rouge, uh, senior Khmer Rouge people in that area that confirmed that Taizo Ichinose was taken to this place called Pakadong, this field hospital out in the eastern region in Kampong Chum where it was believed and it was known that he'd been beaten to death instead of uh, being shot, that he'd been lapidated that he'd been beaten to death because the Khmer Rouge thought that he was stubborn and they believed him to be an American spy. So, yeah, so a, what effect did, did his death or well, in your recovery of his bones or, or what bones you recovered, what did that have on the investigation to find Sean Flynn? What, what sort of fallout happened because of that? Okay. So, um, in Danger on the Edge of Town, and in, in the books that Tim Page had written, like Derailed and Uncle Ho's Victory Garden, it had been suggested by Tim Page and by many other people that Sean Flynn and Dana Stone had been killed in uh, Camp Hong Chum in 1971. They'd survived one year. And for a long time, it was reported that way. And then, as I said, when I first started working with Tim, Tim had recovered bones in 1989 out in the area one village away from where i ended up covering remains in 2010 and the remains that he found he believed were either sean flynn or dana stone or both of them but u.s lab confirmed that it was uss columbia eagle mutineer clyde mckay whose bones that they'd found in 1989 they confirmed it by dna and then his remains have been repatriated but then so when i went out there i thought that i was there was a possibility that, that I was going to recover Sean, Sean's remains because everybody had said that the person that had died out there was this famous photographer that looked like Sean Flynn and that had these high arching eyebrows and all of this type of stuff, which Taizo had high arching eyebrows. And um, Taizo was from Okinawa, so 
um, from Kyushu and Okinawan Islands. And the people from that area, he was an indigenous Japanese. The people from that area, they are a, a combination of Japanese, but they also have some um, Caucasoid bloodline. So uh, that's, prob that's why he, he was confused as an American. Also, he could speak English and he couldn't speak Cambodian so well. And he was trying to communicate with his captives, his captors in English and Chinese and Japanese. But English was a working language that they used with the captors. And he made the mistake of telling them that he'd worked for a U.S. news agency. So the local Khmer Rouge used that as uh, a means to confirm to them that he was a U.S. spy and they killed him. So once we found the, those remains in 2010, firstly, all of the reporters and Tim Page and all these people believed that I had resolved the mystery, Tim Page's mystery that he and, and his theory about the 1971 death, I'd finally found Sean Flynn. However, we found out that the remains were not that of a, because of we did, because the US lab did like mitochondrial DNA comparison, and um, they were able to work out that this individual was actually from the M25 haplo group. M25 haplo group is a rare haplo group from the Okinawan Islands, specifically Kyushu, which is where Taizo came from. So when we found the remains of Taizo, as I said, it triggered this international press um, feeding frenzy. David Letterman got on the show and said, on his show, did his jokes and said, oh, the son of Errol Flynn has been found in Cambodia. You know how we know? Well, there was a whole bunch of swash and buckle found near the grave. Like all of this crazy stuff started happening straight away. Like it just went straight into popular culture and we were getting phone calls from every journalist in the world trying to speak to us, trying to find out what we could tell them about the whole situation, saying, oh, you guys finally found Sean Flynn. And we were saying from the beginning, we don't know if we found Sean Flynn. We're on the trail of all of these journalists that went missing and it could be any one of these foreign nationals. But the news of the world were not known for being very credible. And these were the guys who kind of broke the story, the news of the world. They ended up getting shut down because of um, they were spying on celebrities and stuff and, uh, and sexually compromising, harassing celebrities. So it was no surprise to me that news of the world created this disinformation campaign because to them it was better to uh it was a better story that somebody had found sean flynn even if it wasn't true so then about six months after that the u.s lab confirmed no these guys didn't find sean flynn they actually found some japanese guy but we're not going to go any further on that because this is create this has been such a shit fight that we're, we're not really interested in pursuing it so brantley and i had no other option but to go it alone and yeah, over the years, you know, I was working for the U.S. government at times and reporting to the defense attache in the U.S. embassy in Phnom Penh. And then other times when we were on the outs, it was just Brantley and I working with a sponsorship from Ford Motor Company and, and going and, and hitting all these sites with my father and with our, our friend Keith Rotherham and going all around Cambodia trying to find out what happened to all of these different journalists. And then it wasn't until six months after President Trump, uh, Trump's administration began that I was called to the embassy and then I started to officially work as a um, contractor for Stony Beach Defence Intelligence Agency. And then I was tasked with looking around in Cambodia on all of these different investigations investigating all of these different lost locations in cambodia and uh all the u.s priorities lost cases in cambodia like air crashes and uh you know, people being lost on the ground losses and air crashes and then uh during that process i was able to slowly but surely find out little bits and pieces about the remains of the person that i'd found and then when I finally got back to Australia, I was able to piece together, get the photos, do the photographic comparisons and realise we found Taizo Uchinose. So there's been a whole bunch of podcasts that I've done with Michael Henshaw, who was the US Joint Operations Mortuary Affairs Chief that got me involved in this and trained me in it in the first place in two, from 2005. 
and he wasn't. So yeah, this has been, it was a very long project. I was first re recruited into this MIA thing by people, elements of the US government in 2005, like one year after I'd arrived in Vietnam. But um, so when I went and I did that recovery with Brantley, I'd been trained from 2005 until 2010 by Michael Henshaw, this senior Joint Operations Military Affairs commander who was very experienced, who'd worked in North Korea and chosen reservoir in, in Vietnam. He was training me as like a forensic anthropologist, but like not particularly a forensic anthropologist, like a field operator that had forensic anthropolog anthropological knowledge. And um, he taught me, you know, how to do a, a field recovery, which isn't exactly a, it's not like most recoveries if the US government are going to do it, they'll, they'll use like a, a team of archaeologists, but just doing a straight field recovery from a mortuary affairs point of view, sometimes it's it's a little less complicated. Sometimes we can use that mechanical excavation to get down to a, a particular level and then dig and find something. Sometimes we you can just be as lucky as going to a location and seeing a combat boot sticking out of the ground with the bones in there and you have to dig it up yourself roughly until the team can come in. But, yeah, that's a point that I want to make. After I found those remains in Cambodia, the Americans sent a team from Hickam, Hawaii, and uh, there was like 30 different U.S. specialists that went out there, and they did the technical dig of the area that Brantley and I had recovered those remains, and they recovered even more remains there. So uh, that whole area was dug out. Tim Page, for some time, and his wife were saying in the press that, Scott Brantley and I had dug up a mass grave and that's not true because the US government went in there and dug everything out and they just found like bits and pieces of uh, the individual that Brantley and I had recovered because you have to remember when somebody is lapidated, the pressure of those stones getting dropped on top of them, what's going to be left of their remains at the end of the day is just going to be mincemeat and bone fragments and that's and the reason why we were lucky in this in this endeavor was the fact that Taizo Ishinose's parents were wealthy and when he got hit in the face with that baseball they put in all this space age metal and high density porcelain into his mouth and that was what survived after all of those years after he was lapidated was that portion of his jawbone was held together by that space age material well, it, it sounds incredibly, when you talk about being an adventurer, and it sounds arduous, it sounds like something that's a difficult a difficult mission, a difficult task to, to do, just to, just getting around would be difficult, in my opinion. Um, I don't get out of Tennessee yes, very much. So my <laughs> question is, my question for you is, what sort of challenges did you have that were, were like, really stand out in your mind, some, you know, challenges in, in um, whatever it would be in this process. Okay. Yeah. So in Cambodia, the main challenge is, is that there are two kinds of people. There are the, the people that um, did, were involved in the genocide and then there's the victims and survivors of the genocide. And uh, the, the, the people that, the Khmer Rouge that were involved in killing these people they were still on the ground in the location where we were looking around. And yes, they had, they had been involved in these crimes 25 years before, but they didn't want some American guy and some Australian guy unearthing their crimes at a time when senior Khmer Rouge leadership were being uh, tried by the United Nations. And uh, that that's just the tip of the iceberg, but... You just didn't know who was on your side and who wasn't on your side, but we generally knew that nobody was on our side. But um, and then there was a then there was a threat of landmines, and there was landmines everywhere. And we were actually working at a former Khmer Rouge field hospital in 1979 when the Vietnamese invaded the eastern border. The Cambodians laid all these landmines around the hospital site, and then they retreated and they burnt their mud maps. So they, they laid all these landmines so that if the Vietnamese come into that area that they were going to trip these landmines. And there was a lot of UXO in that area. A lot of uh, locals 
had died from unexploded ordnance in that area. One time we were coming into a village and uh, we saw some people digging and then we went over to another section and we heard like a big boom, boom. And it was so big that our, our camera, our video camera cut out. And later on when we came back, it turned out that these individuals had dug up a, a CVU, a cluster bomb unit, these three people, and they were just blown to smithereens. So this was the, the same day we were on the location and it happened approximately like a kilometre away from where we were. And when we're driving out there in the Jeep, we understood that the Khmer Rouge's favourite trick was double placing anti-tank mines on top of each other, like pressurised anti-tank mines. So they're one there, one there, both pressurised mines. So pressurised mine form, pressurised mine form. So any vehicle that was underneath it was just being completely annihilated. And uh, so, yeah, there was, there was always the threat of political thugs and murderers who we were actually investigating the crimes that they committed 25 or 30 years before of those guys putting Brantley and I into a hole as well. It was very dangerous, the whole thing. And then you have to understand there's official US teams that are out there that are being that have twenty million dollars worth of funding. And then there's Scott Brantley and I with our meager seven hundred US dollars. That year the US team returned to Hickam Air Base with one set of remains. They'd spent twenty million dollars going to Laos, Cambodia and Vietnam with the, the greatest US experts that there's ever been in the field of mortuary affairs. And they didn't recover any remains that year. However, Scott Brantley and I, we recovered the remains of Ichinose Taizo on a budget of $700, went in and dropped the remains off at the embassy and pretty much enraged elements of the US government at that time because we had succeeded and we made the US government look like, uh, yeah, yeah, not, not look as favourable as they would want to have looked. So we showed, we showed up a whole government just by bumbling around and being a couple of uh, adventurers. So uh, in April of 1970, and there's a four-day period, I guess, in there, where these 13, yes, 13 different international reporters disappeared, including Sean Flynn and Dana Stone. How did that affect war reporting from, from that point on? Okay, so a lot of these guys, they were like press without borders. These guys were these press without borders guys. And um, before that, that, they were very fearless and there'd never been a point in history. There's, there'd been a lot of journalists that had been killed in action, like Robert Kappa had been killed in Vietnam in 1954, Dickie Chappell, the, the famous uh, the lady with the pearl earrings, the famous American female journalist, she was killed in the in the field, but she was killed in combat operations. There'd never been a time where, like the Taliban operate now, that, that, that there had been a target list of foreign national individuals. So the Khmer Rouge organisation, they call themselves Ankar, which means the organisation, and they had a target list and an uh, on the top of their target list were um, domestic capitalists, foreign capitalists, uh, intellectuals, journalists, uh, teachers, anybody that had any type of connection with the CIA or the KGB or any intelligence service. So to them, how they perceive Sean, how they perceived all of these guys from the Khmer perspective is – Probably if you're from Eastern Europe, you're connected to the KGB. Oh, you're a foreign capitalist, so you're on our target list. So what they decided to do is instead of, like, killing people in a public way and, and like, you know, kind of like how ISIS were doing those type of executions, instead of doing it like that, they decided from a political perspective and a psychological perspective that these people vanishing off the face of the planet and nobody ever finding any evidence of their remains – would be a, an even greater victory, uh, political victory for them. So what Brantley and I did when we found those remains is we, <laughs> we, we were the people that finally contradicted, we, we contradicted that play that they did. 
and we found the remains of somebody. They believe that they were smart enough to hide the remains of these journalists so low in the ground and that they were going to lapidate, stone them and grind their bones to dust so nobody would ever find their remains. And that has been the case in many of these cases because there's still 35, 40 individuals, that press individuals that are missing from the Cambodian war that nobody's found any evidence of. But Brantley and I, we found the remains of Ichinose Taizo out there. And, uh, and yeah, so after that, People were too afraid to go into the field and to report on the Khmer Rouge. So it was very unusual that Taizo Ichinose and that um, Ishiyama Koki, Koki Ishiyama and Taizo Ichinose had in 1973, November 22nd, 1973, had crossed over into Khmer Rouge territory. They were friends with the famous female journalist, uh, American journalist Elizabeth Becker, and Elizabeth Becker couldn't believe that they had done that. She'd been speaking to them. She was close friends with them. She'd been covering the story with them. But once that she found out that they crossed over, like she would never have had agreed for her friends to have done that because every Western knew it was a suicide mission. But these two Japanese believed because they could speak Cambodian that they were Japanese, that the Khmer Rouge were going to look at them favorably, that they had this deal that they were going to cross over into Khmer Rouge territory for three weeks and um, cover the Khmer side of things and that the Khmers were going to let them back over into the government lines. But I think the Khmers realised that these two Japanese guys had seen so much, had known so much and could report on the location of these um, bases that it was a security risk for them to let them go. And then also during the process of interrogation, the Khmer Rouge came to the conclusion that they thought that these guys both worked for the CIA and like okay well these guys are american spies pretending to be japanese journalists so let's just kill them so we have we have sean flynn who we thought or in some of this uh, some of this search and some of this quest for many years thought we, when he was captured that he actually lived for about a year or so wasn't it wasn't that the case yes sir that's, that's that, that was that was the, the reporting that was the standard story and so, but it was because of Tim Page. Finding, it was Tim Page. Now, with Tim Page finding, wrote a book about it. Yeah, called uh, the, "Derailed in Uncle Ho's Victory Garden." In that book, Tim Page like pieced together the the intelligence documents, but then he went like Gonzo journalism, and then like put together the story of the last year of his friends in Camp Hong Chum. But he didn't know at that time when he wrote that book that he hadn't found those guys and that. So he, you know. He put two and two together and it added up to 24. And so when you found Tiazzo's bones. Tizo, sir, yeah. Tizo, yeah. sorry. Whenever yeah. that that happened, you set something, you, you changed the timeline at that point. Is that, is that safe yeah. to say? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we were able so, to prove that the person that Paka Dong that was killed in, 19, in the 1970s, like from 19, between 1971 and 1974, wasn't Sean Flynn who was not a Caucasian, as first believed. It was this famous Japanese journalist. So if you look at uh, Taizo's narrative of Taizo, it's fair, fairly similar to the narrative of Sean, but he's a Japanese. Taizo came from a, a rich, influential family. His mother was a theatre actress, and he was a famous photographer from Japan. He was a fashion photographer. He was a celebrity. Sean's mother was a film actress. Sean was a famous photographer from France and America. So the overlap of their story... And also the fact that Taizo was, uh, for a Japanese, he had some Caucasian look to him or a different look to him. And also uh, both Taizo and Sean had these high arching eyebrows, although they were a different race. So the, the, the people had, that had identified as being Sean was because Sean had similar eyebrows to Taizo. And here's a picture of Taizo right here. Yes, sir. And you and, can see, even you can see there. In Vietnam. Yeah. Maybe. But you, you can see the, his mandibular. You can see in that photograph that one side of his jaw was withered. You can see it. And, and so that, that's, that's your overlap. This is when I took the, the mandibular and just did like a jigsaw puzzle, placed it over his face. And you can see there's a hole below. There's, there's a hole. There's scarring there. And there's a hole there that was 
drill through his jawbone to create a drain by the doctors in the surgery once they put that, that um, the the piece in there, the, the, the steel and the porcelain. So you can see on Taizo's face there when he's drinking the beer that there's like a suction point on the skin there that overlaps with where that where the drain was and there's scarring on his face. So it's it's 100% him. We've, we've been able to tentatively, tentatively identify that it's Ishinose Taizo without even, without doing a, a direct DNA match. We've been able to do it like the old fashioned way. Usually people would use dental records, but we're able to overlap the jaw and it fits perfectly over there. And the, the actual markings and the drain drilled in the draw in, into his jaw match with the scarring on his face when he was alive. And then we have the uh, x-ray pictures as well. Yeah, so, so that view of it. you can see that. You can see the damage there. You can see that the, the, a baseball has broken his jaw there and that they've, they've placed this bridge unit, a fixed prosthesis in over where his jaw was damaged. So if you click back to that photograph, which is a side profile of him, if, if you can find that one. Yeah, so that, that side profile, no, 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 back, back. The side profile one, you just were there. One more. Uh, back, 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 back. Oh, this one right here. Yeah, so you can see. You can see where his jaw, where his lip is. There's, there's, a, there's a scar there from where right the here. doctors have went and, and done an incision. And you see his lower lip there. His lower lip is drooping because it's settled on the, on the porcelain uh, bridge fixed prosthesis. It's made his, his lip droop because the synthetic teeth were larger and uh, larger than his original teeth. And so it, it made his lip droop over that fixed prosthesis. So it's him, 100%. It's him that we found. The scarring matches the X-ray scarring. So in finding this um, information out, the information that everybody probably who's listening is curious of is what happened to Sean or what do you think happened to Sean and Dana? So what I, believe, what I believe happened to Sean, and I, I have to be careful about what I say because um, Rory, Rory Flynn and Mike Luring and Cookie Debador, they are they're very, still very much involved in this. So what I believe happened is Sean was a, a target and Dana were a target. They were lured out there they were, and they were murdered within four or five hours of being captured. They were taken to a, a camp not far from where they were captured. They were both executed and their belongings were stolen. Their belongings, their cameras, their jewellery, their glasses, their motorcycles were stolen by the Khmer Rouge out there and the Khmer Rouge sold the, that property off to some Vietnamese soldiers and in return for that property, the Khmer soldiers purchased alcohol and got drunk. So yeah, it's not a it's not a it's not a happy there's no happy end to it. The remains uh, there's uh, multiple locations out in that area of uh Prepadale in Chipu that uh, the US has been investigating for years because there was thirteen different people that were missing out there. So it's just like a process of elimination. You have to dig, you have to dig. But it, it's in my my personal belief is, and this is from uh, my association with a US uh, investigator that ha is the most experienced guy on case 1588, that there's a camp out there on the border where they were killed and that most likely the Americans probably recovered the remains of Sean and Dana in probably about 2012, and that they have they possibly have the remains in custody, and they have not yet completed the identification and and hand the remains back to Rory for repatriation. But I believe that Sean's remains and Dana's remains are in custody at the lab in Hickam, Hawaii, just like how Tizo I know Tizo's remains are there. But with these type of cases, sometimes it can take up to 28 years for a recovery to result into in a, um, an identification and a repatriation. The US government has 
over 3,000 sets of unidentified remains at that lab from, um, from the, the war on terror and, and uh, the Vietnam War. <coughs> so there's been many cases where the U.S. government recovered remains on a unilateral or a trilateral, bilateral um, operation between uh, the U.S., Cambodia, Vietnam, and then those remains have been returned to the U.S. and then it's been determined by the lab, oh, well, this person is from the DNA, this person is Vietnamese or this person is Cambodia, this person is Japanese. And the main problem that we have here is that we can't, we don't have dental records or we don't have DNA comparisons with all of the individuals that fell on that, those battlefields because it's such a long time ago. So it's a very complicated process, the identification process. But because I put so much intellectual uh, energy into this and Brantley and I put so much thought into it and so much research in the 12 years after we found these remains is um, that's how I was able to get to where I got to and, and realize that we found Taizo Ichinose. When I was working for the US government during the Trump administration time, I was sent to multiple locations to do ground penetrating radar scans to look for the remains of Sean and Dana out there. And there was some, there was some times where I I was able to determine that there was a cland clandestine burial beneath where I'd scanned with the radar, but then I gave that information GPS data to the US government. I don't know if that where when uh, whether or not the US teams have went in and dug those locations out because of the classification level that they classify once you're doing this type of work. Usually, U.S. personnel they never know who they've recovered. They it's never it's never possible for them to work out who they recovered. But it's just the strange way in which I was attached to the Defense Intelligence Agency, Stony Beach, with Michael Henshaw, that I was able to Michael Henshaw and Scott Brown, you know, were able to determine that we who we found. Well, we're about out of time, and I certainly appreciate you coming in and doing this. This has been fantastic. The information is is it's it's fascinating in a, a strange odd way i believe that uh, i fell into this rabbit hole uh i didn't i didn't intend to but it's a good rabbit hole to get into because there actually is a conclusion to it there, there is we know information it's not like bigfoot we know we know more information about what happened uh but i have one more question about what happened to sean's belongings did anything like uh, they had cameras they took all that stuff did anything ever, ever show back up of any of that Actually, yes, funnily enough, a couple of years ago, somebody uh, purchased Sean's uh, Nikon F-frame camera with Sean Flynn SF engraved in it, and uh, it, it was purchased on eBay, and the camera was given to Tim Page, and when they tried to determine where the camera had come from, it had been purchased by a French person from a market in Indochina in the late 1970s. So, uh, yeah, what, one of Sean's cameras did come, did come back up to the surface and, uh, and Tim ended up with it. And I want to say, I really, I really want to commemorate Tim. I think Tim was a, he was a, a mercurial type of character on many, many levels, but he was also, he, he was living history. And although he didn't, Although he had problems with me, I never had problems with him. The, the issues between he and I were more like the fact that his lady, did, his lady didn't get along with me and she got in his ear and then kind of turned him against me. But he was my mentor. I was his protege. Tim was taught by Larry Burroughs, the famous British journalist, who was taught by Andre Friedman, who you'd also know as Robert Kappa. So... There's this lineage that I've inherited through Tim. Tim was friends with Neil Davis, the famous Australian journalist, One Crowded, one crowded Hour, and, uh, of One Crowded Hour fame. And uh, the book One Crowded Hour about Neil Davis is the most amazing Australian uh, biography you'll ever read about Neil Davis's time in Vietnam. And uh, then when you see people like... Uh, um, uh, Dana and Sean and Michael Herr and Tim Page. Like, I inherited a lineage from these guys. They're amazing people. 
and I can't say enough about them. Matt Frangiola, he was instrumental in this whole thing. If it wasn't the American journalist Matt Frangiola, and he's been forgotten in all of this because he was a he was a, a press journalist. He was a writ journal. He was, he was a writ print journalist, not a photo journalist. And if it wasn't for him conducting this interview with this Khmer Rouge deserter in 1975, we would never have been able to find out that some foreign journalists had been killed at this hospital site in Pakadong, Camp Chum. So uh, Matt Frangiola passed away from cancer a couple of years ago. I also want to commemorate my father. He passed away about eight weeks ago. And uh, so, you know, that a lot of these old people that they passed on this history to Brantley and I and they involved us in this thing that we would never have been involved in, they're all passing away. And uh, I just want to commemorate Tim and I, I want to. I just want to say that you know, um, as a journalist, as somebody who's inherited this, uh, this I don't know what what, what you call it, but um, you know, Tim was a, probably one of the most famous Gonzo journalists ever ever to have lived, other than Hunter S. Thompson. And uh, so, you know, I was just lucky to have known Tim. I was lucky to have been in, for him to have involved me in this story and I'll f forever be grateful that I was able to meet him and that he was able to um, tell me what he told me, show me what he showed me. And uh, it's it, the value of that. It, it can never be underestimated. Well, thank you very much. And, and for bringing that information to us and our, and our viewing audience, I know it's it means uh, an incredible amount to you, and we want to go out with this picture of Tim Page as we um, commemorate him tonight and dedicate this show to him. Thank you for tuning into the Tim Blaine Show, Dave McMillan. Appreciate you coming back in. What I would like to have you back again, if you would, uh, if you, yes, you sir, want to come of back, of course, anytime, yeah. anytime. Uh, talk. To, I'm sure we can talk for hours about this. This and. Uh, uh, I'm very, very flattered that you brought this to the, to the Tim Blaine show. Thank you very much. I just, I just want to quickly say, I want to shout, put a shout out to all the U.S. personnel out there. You guys keep safe, keep your heads down, and to to my friends at Pearl Harbor, Hickam, Hickam Base in Pearl Harbor. Thank you very much for being as brave, and thank you for your service. Thank you to the U.S. for letting me work with you guys I, and and to everybody in the United States. I love you guys and I will be back in America one day. I'm probably going to immigrate there to tell you the truth, Tim, because there's cool people over there like you. I will be certainly glad to have you take care everybody over and out.